So now we're going to study linear vector spaces. So before we uh, define what a linear vector space is, let's look at the set R, the set of ordered pairs R cross R, or the set of ordered pairs R cross R cross R, which means the set of, of uh, that is made out of X, Y and Z, three elements ordered from R, R, and R, or in general, R power N, R M3, which is the set of matrices that are three by three. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Or in general, the set of square matrices that are N by N. So what do all these have in common? The first thing is, if you have, let's, for example, look at R power 2, which is R cross R. In R cross R, I represent the elements as the set of ordered pairs. So for example, 1, 2. This is an element of R2. y is equal to 3, 4 is also an element of R2 what happens when I add x plus y when I add x plus y I add 1 to 3 gives me 4 4 plus 2 gives me 6 this is an element of R2 which means that R2 similar to what we studied for R is also closed under addition. This also applies for R3, for Rn, and for M3. For example, if I consider the matrix M, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, and if I consider the other matrix N, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 1, 0, 1, 0, M both are elements of M3. When I add M plus N, I'm going to get another matrix. That is also an element of M3. And this also applies for a general N by N matrix. The other thing, so all these sets are closed under addition. The other thing, all these sets have a zero element. Let's say A is equal to zero, zero. This is the zero element in R2 L is equal to 0 this is the 0 element in M3 all the above sets have zero elements which when you add any other elements of those sets to the zero element nothing is changed and you get that element uh, again so for example for every x in R2 if you add x to this a, you get x, because a is the zero element. What else? All these sets have all the above sets. Have an inverse element of addition.
which means let's say x is in R2 and x is equal to 1 and 2 negative x is equal to negative 1 negative 2 and x plus negative x gives me the zero element similarly let's say m is in the set of matrices the set of square matrices 3 by 3 where m is equal to 1 0 0 0 1 0 0 0 1 negative m is equal to negative 1 0 0 0 negative 1 0 0 0 negative 1 m plus negative m is equal to the zero element in addition so all these sets have the same uh, properties or similar properties which leads us to define a general uh, or leads us to the general definition of a linear vector space and the general definition of a linear vector space is as follows any set x so for example any of the above sets is called the linear vector space over the field of real numbers r if the two operations addition and multiplication by a scalar are defined and satisfy the following axioms the first axiom is commutativity which means if I add two elements x plus y it doesn't really matter the order does not matter so I can add y plus x so all of the above sets satisfy this associativity if I add x plus y plus z and I perform x plus y first it's also similar to I will get the same result if I add x plus and then y plus z if I do y plus z first and then add the next is the distributivity of vector addition over scalar multiplication. If I multiply alpha x plus y, so if I have two vectors x plus y, if I add the two vectors and multiply them by alpha, it doesn't really matter the order of our operation. I can add x plus y first and then multiply by alpha, or I can multiply alpha by x and then multiply alpha by y and add the final results and these two will be equal the next property is distributivity of scalar addition over scalar multiplication scalar addition alpha plus beta if I multiply this by a vector x it doesn't really matter if I add alpha plus beta first and then multiply by the vector x or if I multiply alpha by the vector x and then multiply beta by the vector x add the two results the quantity on the left is equal to the quantity on the right the next property is compatibility of scalar multiplication with field multiplica multiplication if I have two numbers alpha and beta I multiply those two numbers and then multiply the result by a vector x this is equivalent to multiplying alpha by the result beta x all of the above uh, or linear vector space has a zero element which means for every x in the linear vector space x Uh, no, so a zero element so there exists a zero vector in x such that for every x in x for every element of the vector of the linear vector space x x plus zero is equal to x inverse element of addition for every x in x there exists 
I'm going to call it negative x, such that x plus negative x will give me the zero vector. Identity element, the last property is the identity element of scalar multiplication. For every x in x, if I multiply 1 by x, I get x. And all these properties define what a linear vector space is. And uh, all the above sets that we just uh, described satisfy all those properties. Now uh, check your book for using these properties to prove that, so use the above properties to show that the zero vector and the inverse elements of addition are unique. Subspaces. The next thing that we're going to discuss is subspaces. So let's look. Uh, so a subspace, by uh, um, a as it implies, is a small space that lives in a bigger space. So for example, let's look at R2. This is R2. Inside R2, I have the space R. So R or let's say any element zero, any element that has the form X zero lives in a subspace. inside R2. For example, or another example, if I have R3, the three-dimensional space that's made out of R, R, and R, this plane is a subspace, the plane is a subspace of the whole space, the plane. subspace of 3D space. So what is the definition? How can I define a subspace? So to define it, I'm going to give you two definitions. The first one is if x is a linear vector space if y is a subset of x y is a subspace if it is closed under addition and multiplication by a scalar. For example, let's look at R2 and the set A. The set A is made out of vectors x0 where x belongs to r so basically so the set a which is made out of ordered pairs x0 example 1 0 2 0 and so on so all these are in a 
Now A is a subspace. Why? Because it's closed under addition and multiplication by a scalar. Which means for every x and y in A, x plus y is also an element of A. That means it's closed under addition. Also for every alpha in R, for every x in A, alpha x is also an element of A. Alpha x, uh, so A is closed under multiplication by a scalar. Another definition of a subspace is x is a linear vector space, y is a, sub, uh, is a subset of x, y is a subspace. If for every x and y in y, for every alpha, beta that are real numbers, alpha x plus beta y, the result of this operation is also in y. These are two equivalent definitions. We basically are saying that y is closed under both addition and multiplication by a scalar. So let's look at some problems. These are just simple problems just to uh, make you understand those definitions. We need to show that the set V, which is made out of the vectors alpha E1. What's alpha E1? Alpha is any real number. E1 is the vector 1, 0. This definition is equivalent to saying the word span of the vector E1. Span the vector E1 means any number, any real number multiplied by E1. So any number multiplied by E1 lives in span, in the set of span E1. So we need to show that this set forms a subspace in R2. So to form a subspace in R2, the set has to be closed under addition and multiplication by a scalar. So let's see addition. So pick, so is V. closed under addition let's see I'm gonna pick two elements in V so let's pick x1 which is equal to let's say alpha 1 0 x2 alpha 2 0 x1 plus x2 is equal to alpha 1 plus alpha 2 and 0 this is a real number because this is a real number then x1 plus x2 satisfy this property therefore x1 plus x2 is an element of V which means V is closed under addition similarly you can show V is closed under multiplication by a scalar Pick alpha 3 belong to R. Alpha 3 x1 is equal to alpha 3 alpha 1 0. This is a real number. This is in V. Therefore, indeed, V is a subspace. Now let's find a counterexample. Is there a set that's not 
is subspace, of course. There are many sets that are not subspace. For example, this set. What is this set? The set V is equal to alpha E1. Alpha 1, E1 is the vector 1, 0. But alpha is only between 0 and 1. So does it form a subspace? Well, let's see. Is it closed under addition or not? Let's pick two elements here. So let's say x1 is equal to 0.5 and 0. x2 is equal to 0 0.75 and 0. Both live in v. But when you add them, you're going to get 1.25 and 0, which is not an element of v. Therefore, v is not closed under addition. So, after the study of subspaces, we need to know what the word dimension of a vector space mean. R has a dimension 1. We know that. R2 is the dimension 2. R3, which is the space, has three dimensions. But what does it mean that it has three dimensions? Or what does it mean that uh, uh, the plane has two dimensions? To understand what this means, first we need to understand something called linear independence. Two vectors are linearly independent if I cannot write them as multiples of each other. Let's look at x, the vector x. So the vector x, which is equal to uh, the two, the ordered pair 1, 5, and the vector y, which is equal to the ordered pair 2, 5. It's clear that x cannot be written as a linear combination of y. x is not equal to, there's no real number such that x is equal to alpha y. So x and y are not linearly dependent. They don't depend on each other linearly. On the other hand, the vector x equal 1, 5, the ordered pair 1, 5, and the vector y equal to 2, 10. Clearly y is equal to 2x. x and y are linearly dependent. Now let's look at three vectors. If I use x equal 1, 0, 0, y equal to 0, 1, 0, z equal to 0, 0, 1, is there a combination such that x is equal to alpha y plus beta z? No. This combination does not exist. Exists. Therefore, x, y, and z are linearly independent. So the formal definition of linear independence, so I'm going to write a set V, which is equal to the vectors V1, v2 up to vn which is equal to a set vi where i is equal to 1 up to n v is linearly independent Or in other words, it's a set of linearly independent vectors. If, 
for every i vi belongs to v vi cannot be expressed linearly in terms of the other vectors in V. So again, the basis of a linear vector space First, in R, R has one dimension. Why does it have one dimension? Because it has one vector, I, where everything in this uh, vector space can be represented as a linear combination of this I. For every x in R, x, there exists a number. in R such that x is equal to x1i. What about R2? For every x in R2 there exists x1 and x2 that are real numbers such that x can be written as x1 e1 or x1 i and this is j x1 i plus x2 j and similarly i if i choose i j and k for every x in R3, there exists three numbers that are real numbers such that the vector x is written as x1 e uh, i plus x2 j plus x3 k. So the basis of a linear vector space is defined as follows. A basis set B of a linear vector space V is a set of linearly independent non-zero vectors. So we have here, in when we're talking about R, the basis set B is equal to the vector I. When we're talking about R2, the basis set here is equal to I and G. And we're talk when we're talking about R3, the basis set here is equal to I, J, K. So B is a subset of the vector space, and any vector in that vector space can be expressed as a linear combination of the elements of the set B. So any vector in R can be a linear combination of that I. Any vector in R squared can be a linear combination of I and J. Any vector in R3 can be a linear combination of I, J, and K. What is the dimension of a linear vector space? The dimension is the number of elements in its basis set. So when we're talking about R, R has only one dimension because the basis set has one element. R2 has two dimensions because the basis set has two elements. R3 has three dimensions because the basis set has three elements.
Now, we're going to now uh, talk about uh, or present a, an abstract problem to show that any element in a basis set is uniquely expressed in terms of the elements of the basis set. So if I have a set B that's equal to E1, E2, and so on up to En, and it's a basis set for a vector, uh, a linear vector space V. Now it's a basis set, that means it's a, a linearly independent set of vectors. And every element of V has a unique decomposition in terms of the element of B. That's why it's a basis set. Now, uh, sorry, it has a decomposition in terms of the elements of B. We need to show the uniqueness of that decomposition. But we need to know, show that any elements in V it can be uh, expressed uniquely in terms of these elements E1, E2, E3, up to En. So in order to do this, so f first let's just give you an example. Maybe this is J. I, J, and K. X is equal to 5I plus 3J plus 7K. There's only, for this particular X, there's only the combination 5, 3, and 7 that can represent X. So 5, 3, and 7 are unique for the vector X. In other words, I cannot find I cannot find another combination to represent X. So now we need to prove this result for any linear vector space. So to show uniqueness, so this is the proof. To show uniqueness, assume that 2 exists. So we first assume that the expression is not unique. So we assume that x is equal to the sum from i equal 1 to n xi ei, which is also equal to the sum of i equal 1 to n yi ei, which means we found two combinations of, of numbers. The combination one is xi and another combination yi, both represent x. Now we're going to take the first combination minus the second combination and we know that this is equal to zero or the zero vector which is equal to the sum from i equal 1 to n x1 xi minus yi multiplied by ei which is basically equal to x1 minus y1 e1 plus x2 minus y2 e2 and so on plus xn minus yn multiplied by en this is equal to the zero vector and since ei is linearly independent it's a set of linearly independent vectors then the only combination is the trivial combination that will produce the zero vector. Then the above combination is only possible if for every i 
all those i equal 1 up to n xi minus yi equal to 0 which right away gives me that xi equal to yi which means that x that the decomposition is unique I can only find one set to represent x, one set of numbers to represent x. So let's uh, solve some problems. Now, when we, in this course, uh, to represent a vector, sometimes I use the curly brackets, and sometimes I use this representation, and they're both equivalent. For matrices, I'm always using this representation. So for problem one, show that E1 is uh, E1 equal to 1, 1, E2 equal to 2, 2. Do not form a basis for R2. So let's just graphically see it. E1 is equal to 1, 1. E2 is equal to 2, 2. So this, is th this vector gives me E1. This vector gives me 2, 2. They are uh, on the same line. And basically, e, E2 is equal to 2, E1, which means they are linearly dependent. Therefore, cannot form a basis set. Okay, let's see another example. Let's say E1, E2, E1 is equal to 1, 1, and E2 is equal to negative 1, 1. Can these form a basis set? And if they form a basis set, we need to find the unique expansion of x, which is equal to 10, 12, in the basis set b is equal to e1 and e2. So first, this is e1, which is equal to 1, 1. This is e2, negative 1, 1. So the question is, is e1 of equal to e alpha e2 no which means there is no real number such that e1 equal to alpha e2 Therefore, E1 and E2 are linearly independent. Therefore, they can form a basis set for R2. So the question now is, what is the expression of x in E1 and E2? So x is equal to alpha 1 E1 plus alpha 2 E2. What are these numbers? Well, let's try. X is 10 and 12. E1 is 1 and 1, so alpha 1, alpha 1, plus negative 1, 1 multiplied by alpha 2, which is equal to alpha 1 minus alpha 2, alpha 1 plus alpha 2. From this, you can get that 10 is equal to alpha 1 minus alpha 2, 12 is equal to alpha 1 plus alpha 2. Therefore, alpha 2 is equal to 1, 
and alpha 1 is equal to 11 which means that x is equal to 11 alpha 1 sorry 11 e1 plus e2 graphically what does it mean x is equal to 10 12 so in the regular or traditional basis set x means you need to walk 10 steps in this direction and then walk 12 steps in this direction so this is x 10 and 12 instead of those two directions we can express it x in these two directions where e1 is equal to 1 1 and e2 is equal to negative 1 1 in this case x you need to walk 11 steps in this direction and then one step in this direction and you get x And so you can see that you can express x in two different ways depending on the basis set of your choice. If you choose your basis set to be 1 and 1 and negative 1 and 1, if you choose your basis set to be these e1 and e2, then you have a different representation of x. So this is another example that you should read. It's you're going to find it in your textbook. Okay, notation. What is the how we des we describe elements in this? Uh, uh, how do we write elements in the in this course? X is a vector, three-dimensional vector. I can write X as x1, x2, x3. Or I can write it like as x1, x2, x3, which are th three real numbers. I can also write xi to represent any of x1, x2, and x3. M belong to the set of matrices that are square I will write it like this M11 will represent the first number M12 first row second column M21 second row first column M22 second row second column I'm gonna use MIJ to represent the entry in the ith column and jth row of course remember that x belong for every x belong to r3 xi is a real number and for every m any matrix in the set of matrices let's say power 3 mij which is the entry in the i row and the gist column is a real number so now after we defined what a vector space is and what the basis set is we need to talk about the size what are the sizes of the vectors now you are used to the size of vectors you're used to 
the Euclidean size or the Euclidean norm. norm. For example, you're used to if x is equal to 1, 1, 3, for example, you're used to that the size of x is equal to the square root of the first number squared plus the second number squared plus the, th the third number squared. This is called the Euclidean norm or the Euclidean size of the vector. There are many other norms, but we, in this course, we're o only going to be talking about the Euclidean norm, and in the Euclidean, the Euclidean norm, if x belongs to Rn, then the Euclidean norm is defined as the square root of the x1 squared, plus x2 squared, plus x3 squared, and so on, plus xn squared. That's what the Euclidean norm is. Now, the size of a vector is not, does not really need to be measured by the Euclidean norm. There are many other norms, and the norms really uh, depend on the Many, uh, many other aspects that we don't have to go uh, or to explain in details, but the important thing to know is that the, no the norm, any choice of a norm function, has to satisfy the following properties. Any choice. first thing that it needs to be satisfied is that the size of a vector is equal to zero if and only if or is equivalent to saying that the vector is equal to the zero vector the other thing is that if I multiply the vector x by a real number then this is equivalent to taking that real number, the absolute value of this number, and multiplying by the size of the vector x. And the, fir the third thing is the triangle inequality. And you should read your textbook. And verify that Euclidean norm satisfy all the above properties of the norm function. The other thing that we need to do is find distances between vectors. The distances between vectors is important to know how close vectors are to each other. So if I have a vector x that's equal to 1, 1, 0 0.5, and if I have another vector that's equal to 1.1, 1, 1, 1, 0 0.5, I need a measure that tell me that y is really close to x while z that's equal to 1.1, 1 1.5, 1 .5, 0 0.5 is not as close to x as y. So I need some sort of a distance between these vectors. So the distance, the distance that we're using in this course is the Euclidean distance. And the Euclidean distance between two vectors is equal to the norm or the Euclidean norm of the difference between those two vectors. So this is equal to the square root 
let's say x and y live in Rn this is equal to x1 minus y1 squared plus x2 minus y2 squared and so on up to xn minus yn squared in general I would like the norm function to do the following or sorry the distance function has to satisfy the following the distance between x and y has to be equal to the distance between y and x the distance between x and x has to be equal to zero and finally has to satisfy the triangle inequality which if I have a vector here and a vector here and a vector here this distance has to always be less than the sum of this distance plus this distance and you should check that our choice the Euclidean distance does satisfy the properties of a general the properties of a general distance function Another important thing that we would like to uh, present here, which is the Euclidean dot product, which is an example of a bigger family of functions called the inner product. So let's talk about the uh, Euclidean dot product first. If x and y live in Rn, then x dot y is defined as x1 y1 plus x2 y2 and so on the dot product is a linear operation which means alpha x dot y is equal to alpha x dot y. So the Euclidean dot product is a linear operation. If you multiply uh, a real number alpha multiplied by a vector x and then you take that dot product with y, it's also equal to if you take the dot product first between x and y and then multiply by alpha. In fact, for every three vectors, in an n-dimensional vector space and for every two real numbers we have alpha x plus beta y dot vector z is equal to alpha if you take the dot product x with z first plus beta y dot z. The linearity of the operation allows us to either perform this operation first and then take the dot product with z, or take the dot product of x with z, the dot product of y with z, and then multiply by alpha, and then multiply by beta, and then add the results.
he orthogonal vector the 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 definition of the equation not product allows us to define vectors that are perpendicular to each other two vectors are perpendicular to each other if their dot product is zero so for example let's consider uh, e1 equal to 1 0 e2 is equal to 0 1 e1 dot e2 is equal to 0 therefore which is equal to 1 multiplied by 0 plus 0 multiplied by 1 is equal to 0 therefore e1 is orthogonal to e2 let's have another example x is equal to 1 negative 1 2 y is equal to negative 1 1 1 if I take the dot product of x and y, this is equal to 1 multiplied by negative 1 plus negative 1 multiplied by 1 plus 2 multiplied by 1. This is equal to 0. x is perpendicular to y or orthogonal to y. Another example, x is equal to 1, negative 1, 1 y is equal to negative 1, 1, 0 x dot y is equal to 1 multiplied by negative 1 plus negative 1 multiplied by 1 plus 1 multiplied by 0 this is equal to negative 2 x is not orthogonal to y all right so we are dealing in uh, solid mechanics with what is referred to as the Euclidean vector spaces. And the Euclidean vector spaces are those spaces that are both uh, equipped, that are linear vector spaces in which I can use the Euclidean norm and the Euclidean distance and the Euclidean uh, dot product. So I can use Euclidean size or norm, Euclidean distance or metric. and Euclidean dot product. If I'm able to do all this, I call the space a Euclidean vector space. A very important property that you should never forget, and I've squared it here and in, in, put it inside a red square, is that the norm of any vector, the square of the norm of any vector, is equal to the dot product of that vector by itself. Remember, we define the dot product using a certain uh, definition and we define the norm using a different definition. Now they both are equal in this way. So norm or the size of x squared is equal to this. Uh, since it's squared, the square root is not longer there. It's equal to x1 squared plus x2 squared plus xn squared. And x dot x is equal to x1 x1 plus x2 x2 and so on. And therefore these two are equal. Another important aspect of Euclidean vector spaces is the fact that I can choose my basis set to be orthonormal. Orthonormal means that the basis set vectors are both perpendicular to each other and the size of each is equal to 1. 
if I choose I, which I call here E1, 1, 0, and J, which I call E2, and J, which I call E2, which is equal to 0, 1, E1 and E2 are perpendicular to each other and the size of E1 is equal to the size of E2 is equal to 1 so E1 and E2 form an orthonormal basis set so a basis set is orthonormal Ortho means perpendicular, normal means have size of 1. If all its vectors are perpendicular to each other, and the size of each vector and the norm of each vector is equal to 1 so assume so let's look at the property of an orthonormal basis set let B is equal to E1, E2, and so on, up to En, be an ortho normal basis set, of course, for an n-dimensional vector space. There are n vectors that are the basis set for Rn. Notice the following. E1 dot E1 has to be equal to norm E1 squared, which, since I'm using a Euclidean vector space, in a Euclidean vector space, the dot product and the size are related using this formula. And since it's an orthonormal basis set, means the size of each element is 1, so E1 dot E1 is 1. E1 dot E2, they're perpendicular to each other, other is 0. So I can simply, and this applies to e2 dot e2, e2 dot e3, and so on, so I can simply write ei dot ej is equal to either 1, that's if i equal j. And if i is not equal to j, this is equal to 0. Another very important Another important aspect of the orthonormal basis set is how can I find the e expression of any vector in that orthonormal basis set. So I know that A, let A be in Rn. A is just a vector in Rn where A can be expressed as A1, E1 plus A2, E2 and so on all the way to up to a n e n I would like to find a dot e3 for example a dot e3 is equal to a1 e1 plus a2 e2 dot e3 now we just talked about the dot product which is a linear operation which means I can since it's a linear operation, I can just say that this is equal to E1, E1 dot E3 plus E2, E2 dot E3, and so on. Let's just write the E3, E3 dot E3.
But since this is an orthonormal basis set, I know that E1 dot E3, E1 is perpendicular to E3. So this goes. E2 is perpendicular to E3. This goes. And so on. I'm going to be left with E3. E3 dot E3. But E3 dot E3, it's an orthonormal basis set. E3 dot E3 gives me the size of E3, which is 1. So this gives me an E3. Which means when I take the dot product of A with the basis factor A3, I'm getting the projection of A onto A3, E3, which is equal to E3. And in general, I can write A dot EI equal to AI. The, per the I's basis factor, when I take the dot product of A with the I's, I's basis factor, I get AI very simple example 1 0 equal e1 e2 equal to 0 1 vector b is equal to 5 7 for example b dot e1 is equal to 5 7 dot e1 which is 1 0 which will be equal to 5. b dot e2 will be equal to 7. So let's look at some problems. Which of the following sets are orthonormal basis set for the Euclidean vector space R2? Now, of course, here e1 dot e2 equal 0 and norm e1 equal norm e2 equal 1 therefore b1 is orthonormal here right away norm e1 is equal to the square root of 1 squared plus 1 squared which is equal to square root of 2 is not equal to 1 therefore b2 is not so sometimes I would like to get the projection of one we this define the orthogonal vector sometimes I'd like to get the projection of one vector onto another I would like to get A vector z and another vector z bar such that z bar such that v is equal to z plus z bar z z bar is perpendicular to u so how to find that orthogonal projection z so z is the orthogonal projection of v on u. How can I do that? Well, z is defined as v dot u u divided by norm u squared. This is z. And to prove that this is true, I need to find z bar and I need to show that z bar is perpendicular to u. So z bar is equal to v minus z. I'm saying that v is equal to z plus z bar. Therefore, z bar is equal to v minus z, which is equal to v minus v dot u, u divided by norm u squared. Is z bar perpendicular to u. Well, let's take the dot product. u dot z bar is equal to u dot v minus v dot u. We 
again the dot product is a linear operation therefore I can say u dot v minus v dot u u dot u divided by norm u squared remember the dot product u dot u in the Euclidean vector space is equal to the norm of u squared so this is equal to that and u dot v is equal to v dot u therefore this is equal to zero the next operation that's defined only in R3 is the cross product it's a very special operation defined only in R3 and the purpose of this operation is to give me a vector such that this vector is perpendicular to both the original two vectors. So I'm given two vectors. I would like to find a vector such that this vector is perpendicular to the original two vectors. So this is the cross product is an operation divide, uh, described on R3, cross R3 any two vectors here I can take the cross product and the result of the cross product is a vector so this vector for every vector in R3 for every u and v in R3, z is defined by u cross v such that z is perpendicular to the original two vectors. So z is perpendicular to u and z is perpendicular to v. the operation u cross v since we have two vectors we have two directions perpendicular to u and v which is the positive and the negative directions u cross v is equal to negative v cross u the third property of this is that the size of the new vector is equal to the size of the original vector minus u dot v squared now why do I need to control the size well I need to control the size so that this gives me the square this gives me the square of the area between u and v so basically if I have a u a vector u and a vector v the vector z which is perpendicular to both will be equal to the size of this vector will be equal to this area in red so norm z squared equal the square area in red so this definition so we define it using those three properties we define the cross product using these properties allows us to come up with a few conclusions the first conclusion is that when I take the cross product of E1 and E2 I have to get E3 because that's the one that's perpendicular to the 
to both E1 and E2. So if I take the cross product of E1 and E2, I get, in fact, I usually, I should get positive or negative E3, but I will utilize the right hand, hand rule, which is E1 uh, according to this, E1, E2, and E3. So I utilize the positive, that I choose the positive according to the hand right hand rule orientation. And similarly, if I take e, E2 cross E3, I should get E1, and E3 cross E1, I should get positive E2. The other thing that's very important, or the other result that's very important based on the definitions, is that if two vectors are linearly dependent, which means they have the same direction, or means u is equal to alpha v, then those two vectors, if I take their cross product, I will get the zero vector. The final result is that, the, or one of the other results, is the explicit representation of the cross product in an orthonormal basis set in R3, which is according to the uh, expression that you know when you studied the cross product in earlier years, u cross v is equal to u2 v3 minus u3 v2 in the direction of u1, plus u3 v1 minus u1 v3 in the direction of u2, and so on. And this is, I think, you're used to representing it this way, i, j, k, u1, u2, u3, v1, v2, v3. And this gives you a something in the direction of i plus another in the direction of j plus another in the direction of k which is basically this expression another important result of the above is the triple product if i have three vectors the triple product of those three vectors gives me the following if i have u v and w the triple product defined as u or u dot v cross w let me just write them so that's v cross w dot u so V cross W will give me a vector that's perpendicular to both and is equal to this area. So this is W or V cross W. And when I take the dot product so this is gives me area and u gives me the height so this gives me volume of shown in the figure. So the triple product between three vectors gives me the volume, which means if u and v and w are linearly dependent, the area is, which means area is zero, or the height is zero, therefore this means that the u dot v cross w will be equal to zero.
So again, if they're linearly dependent, they're zero. And the last result, if u, v, and w form an orthonormal basis set, then u dot v cross w is equal to y. If u is perpendicular to v, perpendicular to w, and norm u is equal to norm v, is equal to 1. Therefore, their triple product is equal to 1. Notice that the con converse is not true. And you should find an example of three vectors where u dot v cross w is equal to 1, but u is not perpendicular to v, is not perpendicular to w. But U, V, and W are not orthonormal. The last section in this uh, in the linear vector spaces is the graphical representation of Euclidean vector space. The graphical representation, the first is how do you take the, the, the graphical representation of the dot product? If I have x, vector x and vector y, x dot y, which we defined it as x1, y1, plus x2, y2. Let's say x and y live in R2. Since they live in R2, they only have two components. So x dot y is equal to x1, y1 plus x2, y2. The geometric representation x dot y is equal to norm x, norm y, cosine theta xy. If I have x and y in R3, and since x and y in R3, I can take the cross product. Remember, the cross product is only defined in R3. x cross y is defined as above. x cross y is defined as above. This is also equal to norm x or the size of x, the size of y, sine theta xy. Okay, all these are numbers. This is a number, the size is a number, the size is a number, the sine is a number, but x cross y gives me a vector, so I have another vector n. This is x, this is y, this is theta xy. n is a vector That's perpendicular to both x and y. n dot x is equal to n dot y is equal to 1. And here, norm n is equal to 1. And this is it for the linear vector spaces. The rest is how to represent and draw all these things in Mathematica and uh, that will be presented in a different video.